Hello and uh, welcome to another special presentation by the Australian Intercultural Society. My name is George Danikian. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to also acknowledge that I'm a, a member of the advisory board of the Australian Intercultural Society uh, in Victoria and have been for the better part of, I think, the last eight to nine years. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time and don't understand the work of the AIS, it does an extraordinary amount of good work every year to help uh, build bridges and develop a positive dialogue between Australia's uh, many communities. The current global emergency, the so-called COVID-19 pandemic has unleashed a, a great deal of distress and disruption right across the globe. The emergency has also added a new layer of complexity and angst to our lives. And for the majority, I should say that people have behaved very, very well. It's been an extraordinary time. I, I, I believe that people have been both considerate and collegiate uh, about their fellow citizens. However, whilst many have been exemplary, we have seen a rise in what has been described as poor behavior, uh, seriously appalling behavior in some instances that has distressed many Australians uh, some of it, of course, uh, as usual, stoked by uh, the mainstream media, which tends to paint everything these days, uh, either black or white. Uh, there have been examples of subtle racism through too that we'll touch on as well. Things amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, how do we address what's happened? Uh, these examples, this rise in abuse and uh, uh, racism. Uh, well, I wanted to help someone uh, who knows the subject matter better than most to uh, allow us to get some measure of comfort. I thought pick someone who understands it better than anyone to help us navigate these waters and address the current issues and some of the problems that have arisen. And to help us better, uh, no, you, you go to the very top. Sydney, from Sydney, I, I'd like to welcome at this juncture, Australia's uh, Racial Discrimination Commissioner, Chin Tan. Uh, Chin, welcome to this AIS special. Good afternoon, George. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, I, I'm not currently in Sydney, the office is based in Sydney. I have been holed up down here in Melbourne, which is my Whoa. hometown, for the last two months. So on that, on that basis, I'd like to welcome you all, acknowledge obviously the traditional custodians, the Wurundjeri people, which is the, the, the custodians of this land that I, I'm here now based in, and, and to obviously uh, pay my respect to the elders past and present. Uh, I'm glad you declared your interest, your conflict of interest uh, with AIS. Uh, I'm not a member of AIS, but I'm a very, very good friend and supporter of AIS for the wonderful work they do. Now, you have uh, uh, done an awful lot of work uh, with them in the past. You were Director of Multicultural Engagement at uh, Melbourne's uh, Swinburne University of Technology. Um, from that time and now, what were the challenges when you were in that post and some of the challenges today? Uh, you used the word amplified, and it's, it's correct to say that because there are times when things coalesced. And, and I've said to my colleagues at the Human Rights Commission that uh, COVID-19 is a crisis of sort, but it's also offering opportunities that we've never seen before. For me, the work that I would normally take about two years to fiddle with and work through, it's all come about in the last few months, and suddenly it's all condensed, and I'm running issues. I've never run before, and I'm concentrating and focusing on different aspects of racism that's all come about in a one very, very pointy end. And so for me, it's an opportunity to learn quickly, obviously, but to be able to mobilize quickly as well, working with governments, working with all sorts of stakeholders and trying to frame that narrative of what's important. You mentioned that you've called in someone like me talking to me as an expert. Can I say this, I beg to differ. There is no, there's no, there's no expert in racism. We all experts okay. in race issues because we all take responsibility and we all know what's right or wrong, what we shouldn't be doing. So where my expertise would be crafting a framework for government, working through the process of how we can deal with issues when they arise or how our thinking process, our mindset to get to one where we understand that as an Australian value in terms of human rights and you know, in terms of what's decent, we frame it correctly. Now, uh, the uh, man that you replace was Tim uh, yes. uh, Pomasan, and he had a very different approach. I think once upon a time he was described as a bit of a crusader. Uh, you've decided to take a slightly different approach because you believe the, uh, the dialogue and the discussion has moved on. 
I, I don't think uh, Tim has um, offered a different way of approaching it. Tim uh, was focused on one aspect of how we can tackle this issue. And he's taken uh -huh. it on board as an important element in his term. And he's, he's entitled to do that. What he has done was to focus the issues in a visible sense of what is out there. I'm still doing that. Uh, for me, anti-racism campaigns, being out there, calling out, are uh, important. But I'm also following it from what Tim has done, build on other things that are equally important. Now, I, I came from a multicultural background, more than about anti-racism. They're not different. I've always said there are two aspects of the different sides of the coin. Uh, you couldn't tackle one or the other. Uh, Tim, obviously, with the limited time and the resources he had, was focused on one aspect. For me, I want to do both of that if I can. And, and for me, multiculturalism was where I came from. When I was the chairperson of the Victorian Multicultural Commission, uh, we hardly touched on race, not because they didn't exist. Tim was doing a great job out there, but we're building society in a different way, reframing it in a way that builds harmony, cohesion, and inclusion. And that includes issues like institutional racism, opportunities for someone like me to get up there. You know, I was born in Malaysia and I got Malaysian contacts who are amused and said, you mean, you mean Australia gave a migrant Chinese guy like you a job to run race discrimination? They couldn't believe that. And I said, what's wrong? This is, this is what Australia is. Anyone can do this job. You know? And so this, this is the opportunity to be able to expand on what, what we do well and the values. And I want to be very clear about this as well. A majority, an overwhelming number of Australians reject racism. Right. And I need to be very clear about that. The, the Scandinavian Foundation report every year since 2007 has been very clear. The high majority of Australians who support cohesion, inclusion, right, and be very consistent. And so as, as a country, I think we've got a right basis to run from. But the question is, when things occur, when things aren't right, how do we deal with that? Um, we've, we've seen um, during this pandemic, um, uh, I mentioned the word spike. We have also seen an awful lot of commentary about some of those incidents in the media. Um, uh, what could our nation's leaders, for example, uh, those people in parliament do to actually help the current narrative or the current discussions? Well, I, the important element, obviously, in terms of leadership is the fact that they drive the undertone of what we value. And, and when things don't match up, the question is, what do they do to set it right? And how do they um, take the stand against things, obviously, like racism, you know, or, or even domestic violence, or any issues that are obviously clearly something that confronts us and, and the negative aspects of what society um, can, can turn out to be? And this question, where do they stand on those issues? And standing up means, obviously, calling out, too. That's one aspect of that. That's a narrative. You know, the things that the four things that I set out to do when I became the, the Racial Commission was, was the fact to look at aspects of where we can focus the arenas of work that we can do. One was the constitutional, the laws that we have. Is it strong enough to protect? We are right, right wing extremism is, is pretty strong, and, and, and I'm sure you're going to touch on that. Uh, and, and the foreground, and how do we do it? Is the law strong enough to, to tackle hate crime? The other area is institutional, the institutions that we have, AFL, anyone. You know, ABC, what sort of institutions do they have? We talk about institutional racism, you know, a system still reflect any of that. How do we change that? And there's a lot of work in that area. And, and thirdly, narratives, you know, what we say or don't say, the media reporting, misreporting, inciting, you know, dog whistling, fomenting. Very important. Fomenting. Yes, precisely. The narratives are equal. That's why we're out there a lot more than we should about trying to tackle and counter and curbing that sentiment. And lastly, of course, communities in terms of the understanding and support right across, not just multicultural communities, but the whole community as, a, as Australians. I think one of the things that people need to remember is this, and I made it very clear that to Australians right across, whether in fact you're in Queensland, Perth, Tasmania, or anywhere, I'm not the Federal Race Discrimination Commissioner for the migrants. No. I'm for everybody. It's our values, Australian values, 1975, the Race Discrimination Act. And the first act we have, on anterior discrimination, barely out of white policy. Uh, we said it in, a, in, a, in the act that's very clear, uh, race discrimination is unlawful. Very few uh, countries have done that. 
you touched on the media, you touched on some of our, um, uh, our national uh, iconic uh, institutions, the ABC, uh, the SBS, for example. Now, when I was part of the SBS, we, have a di we had a different charter. At least I believe we had a different charter because I look at SBS today and I'm wondering what mm. their charter is. They're running some fabulous programming, but nothing that helps us to bind a community together. So what is the role of the SBS today? I look at the ABC and they have a, a, a very different uh, charter to the one addressed by Duck Manton, by Dame Leone Kramer. Uh, and today we've seen a, a succession of programs that you would have thought would be on the SBS. So we've got some interesting um, things that we need to address. What have you made of it? So it's not a bad thing that ABC is doing the work of SBS, and that's what we want. I mean, we yeah, want but Channel 9 but I want SBS to, be doing to, to go to the next level. Sure. Um, I think SBS is like any organization is trying to you know, meet the challenges you know, of, of modern days down and the relevance. Uh, and so it should, because for, for SBS to be effective, it must be relevant to all Australians. Right? And, and the last thing you want it to be seen is to be consigned to being an ethnic radio or TV program, programming in you know, a uh, platform. Uh, we want everyone to be watching SBS. And so I suppose there's, there's always going to be immense pressure of trying to make the choices. Uh, but notwithstanding all of that, can I, can I want, you know, can I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a shareholder in SBS. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any shares. None of that, none of that is available. But, but the spirit of what they seek to do is still there. COVID-19 they're the first to translate information into different languages. They're but, out there. But rightly so, but rightly so, yeah. as it should be. Yeah, so, so, so SBS will continue to have a role and we, we're actually working with them. And we just wrote a letter to, the, the, uh, to James Taylor, the, the CEO, saying the suggestion has come up from interfaith groups and all of that saying, you know, there's a lot of good stories in communities, uh, you know, health workers and all of that. And from, from migrant background to tell those stories. You know, share with this so the rest of Australia can understand and appreciate what's happening. And I, I don't think we've done that very well. I mean, my, my daughter is a doctor, you know, she's on the front line. And every day she goes out there and she put herself at risk and the family at risk, the husband is a doctor as well. And I feel for her and I, I you know, it's enormous pressure on them. Those stories are on tell and she's Asian. You know, uh -huh. and that's, that, that's to my message, you know, they don't need that abuse, please, thank you. They're out there saving lives like everybody else is. All right, well, to, with that in mind, what can we do as people, as citizens of Australia, what can we do to confront those who wish to confront us with their uh, example of, um, uh, of racism or abuse? Well, George, let's get back to the very, very basic. The very basic. Um, I think it's a time where people might be frustrated, even fearful. You know, this is very challenging times, difficult, you know, lock at home in isolation, can't talk to anyone. Uh, we don't know what's happening. I want to catch the disease and all of that. It's there. Um, this is the time for reflection. I, I couldn't ask for a better time for Ramadan to happen. <laughs> because Ramadan is about reflection, right? It's, it's about thinking yeah. through those well, issues. As was Anzac Day, a time to reflect. Precisely. To reflect. And it's a, what does that mean, you know, for, for the heroes to have fought? And what are the values we talk about? So the important thing is, as we need to get ourselves the right mindset about what we think about racism, because there's no point out there just following the laws because the law says I can't be a racist, but I can't be racist at home, right? And, and this is, to be fair, this is how government worked and this is how laws work. They're not framed around teaching you to be a good person, to teaching you to make sure you don't behave badly, right? So and, and, and the Race Discrimination Act, for example, does that. It, it provides for a enforcement capacity of saying some behaviors we do not accept, but it's a public domain. So for me, the issue was this, that you can actually, you can actually uh, be a racist in some ways at home and not be caught out, or well, that's your life. But when you go out there in the workplace, you can't. Now, it's, it's a good measure to have that because it's telling us how to behave, but it doesn't teach us all the values that we need to have even in our homes. So, so again, the message is, uh... It starts at home. So it is it to does. do with our parenting. It is to do with the, um, uh, the structure and the respect. And, uh, and I can remember uh, as a young boy growing up, and I was in that unique position 
where I was half Greek and half Armenian, but all Australian. And my father was always uh, adamant that I should represent the Greek community to the best of my ability, yeah. the Armenian community to the best of my ability, not to play favorites, but above yes. all, to be very proud that I was an Australian, not a new Australian, but an Australian. Do yes. you feel a similar message? We need to, again, uh, try and um, encourage to be sent out or it, indeed re let it resonate more and more? Well, tell me important now, you, your dad sounds like a great man. To, uh, you, know, uh, you must be very fortunate to have him as father. The value is obviously shining through, George, even though I'm looking at you. Uh, so the, the importance uh, about this is we're not doing it in isolation. Racism, to be fair, is not confined to black or white issue. You know, on the one hand, you know, this group is racist, the other group is not. Uh, you and I you know racism runs rife and runs across all communities. You know, even within the communities that I represent, ethnic communities or yes. right across. Yes. There. Yeah. So racism yeah. is a human condition. So we need to deal with that. And it's an Australian condition for all of us to deal with, right? It's about our value. You know, we've made it very clear that, you know, we support human rights values. And one of the biggest, strongest is about rights against uh, racism, right? We said, that's what we want as a country. That's what we believe in. But the question is the practice of it. And this is a reflective moment, what it means. Because when things don't turn out right and it's a crisis, we start picking on each other and the race becomes the prominent feature. A question is, how do we teach ourselves not to be like this? And I, I wake up, George, in the morning and say, why do I do this work? Because there is never going to be an end. There is never going to be a place that I sign off, chin down, chin down and done all the work needs to be done. There isn't going to be that day. The next commissioner will have more work to do at a different level. But George, when I get up in the morning, my, my, my conference is this. I said, no child, and I reflect on this, no child is born a racist. They got it somewhere, right? For the home, peers, schools, place they work as they grow up. You know, and right. Mandela said, if they learn it, they can unlearn it. The, the, the job, therefore, is to make sure they don't get it in the first place. <laughs> um, right? for if you've just joined us, uh, a special webinar that has been organized by the Australian Intercultural Society, which does terrific work uh, building bridges and supporting dialogue between Australia's very many communities. We've gone to the uh, Human Rights, uh, the uh, Racial Discrimination Commissioner, Chin Tan, who has been in the job for the better part, I, I think it's coming up two years, is it not? A uh, year and a half over, yeah. Well, happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, let's get back to some of the challenges and some of the uh, uh, positions that you've addressed. Does the commission, from your stance, have enough funding to combat some of the uh, the abuse that we've seen at the moment? Uh, can we can we be smarter and uh, conduct a better strategy to get some of that messaging that you just spoke about into the homes, sure, and then beyond to the schools and to our other institutions? George, the, the short answer is no funding is ever enough. <laughs> but but the reality is, um, if you look at the the funding. The commission gets as a whole. I mean, eight commissioners with multiple, you know, levels and tiers of responsibility. Uh, in my area, I've got uh, four people, I think, including EA, running, um, you know, this national uh, mission. So the, the answer is no. Uh, we we have had uh, under Tim's time and before his time, there was a funding for anti-racism campaign that started before his time, and then it went through 2015 when he was still commissioner, and that funding has formally ceased and so it was self-funded internally there was never enough and so it's actually stopped the campaign moves on with what we can master and we can put together to support it but we're asking for government support we have actually put you know proposals forward um, you know in a couple of years ago and and, and it's still on the, on the table and saying we need this so the work we do is not we're, we're not an NGO we're not community we're government itself so there are different mechanisms of where we work and we put proposals that are different, you know, being able to contact and lobby government differently. And so a lot of the work we do is not actually something that's visible out there. So the point is this, do we need an anti-racism campaign? Yes. But I'm also very careful to ensure that we're not building it as a divisive, uh, divisive campaign, but one that actually make Australians understand it's educational, respect conversa respectful conversation. Uh, and we've no. done that. We've done it. And just to give you an example, what we've done through that area is, is what we did with uh, the end goods um, in the last quarter. 
uh, episode, and we produced together with uh, you know Shalom Island production that, that that had a story about, and we built into our web system within the human rights uh, how to have a respectful conversation about race. So the parents and kids and the friends can sit down and say, okay, we're not pointing fingers at anyone, but we want to talk about issues that are difficult and confronting. We touched on earlier the roles of the ABC and the SBS. Now, you mentioned uh, messaging in a very new way. Uh, it's actually an old way, but used kind of differently. It reminds me of some programming with you. We used to have in the early days of SBS called Hello Australia. And it was an idea to break down the English language and showcase it uh, in a new way, in a, in a form of a quiz show. And we gave examples of Australian isms and, um, and um, the way people used English in Australia to help educate and again, break down some of the so-called barriers. Mm -hmm. And it worked a treat. And it worked so well that I remember traveling the world 10 years later, and I had people in Europe calling out to me, hello, Australia. And yeah. I'm sitting there thinking, how, how do these people know me? And they were, SBS had apparently sold the program around the world yeah. and it had been yeah. used. So there are ways other than the stick, other than this uh, uh, manner that uh, you want to shy away from or stay away from because it, it doesn't work. It creates a bit of a us and them and we don't want that in any way, shape or form, do we? But, but George, um, I, I want to be clear on this. Uh, I, I do have a stick, a very big stick too. Ah. Uh, might be even being in Tim so that I don't always <laughs> use it. Uh, I, I don't get up in the morning and, and ride a, that horse and then you know, go into battle. Uh, <laughs> there's, there, there's a place for battle. There's a place okay. for great building and, and planting. So for me, I need to look at all of that. So, so uh, I'm very vehement about attacking reason when it's over, it's clear. And the one big area which I'm very keen on that we should have resources is the right wing nationalism, extremism. That is a battle where you need a very big stick. And, and the things we talked about might always work. So it calls for a smart approach to different tiers and different layers and being able to hit where it counts. Now, you don't want to use a bazooka, you know, in some areas it doesn't require that, but you now, certainly you, you need want, to focus You want selected targeting, is that what you're Precisely, you're about? precisely. Yeah. Uh, there's no point going up to the suburbs and calling everybody a racist and then you, you get everyone all upset, but, but there are elements and issues that are quite different from when you're talking about right wing extremism and all of that. Uh, they require a different approach and they require very clear pressing capacity to deal with those issues. What, what advice would you give um, the average Australian? I, I keep hearing from many friends of mine that, hey, mate, we have to stand up, we have to speak out against racism. Yeah. So I understand that uh, from your point of view, you don't want to use it as a battering ram, but we need to be brave, we need to be strong, and we need to be fair. But when we see it uh, in some of the appalling incidents that we've seen as of late, um, I've, I've been encouraged by watching those on the periphery, those not in the immediate focus, coming in and trying to break the, um, uh, the, um, the abuse and uh, move on uh, the, the people involved. We have had, though, a couple of incidents where people have been attacked, and, and that's another layer of, yeah. of challenge yeah. that we have to address uh, yeah. straight out. Yeah. I mean, George, the, the, the message uh, is to all Australians. It's about our collective sense of who we are and our values. It's giving all Australians, no matter what background it is, and it's just not a migrant problem, it is a problem that Australia needs to deal with collectively. And this is where it's important that narratives coming from larger Australia, right across, some are quite mainstream, middle Australia, whatever. It's, it's that voice is far more important because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are gonna weigh in the collective, what is it, herd immunity of some sort of saying, the community rejects that and the voice is very clear. I, I've seen petitions come up in all of that, but sometimes I will wish for a petition coming up for non-Chinese, for example. Okay. And it's right okay. across. I mean, got white Australians, you know, English uh, clubs or Scottish clubs, all behind us saying, no, we don't support and we support our Chinese Australians and we are against racism. And that is far more important in some respect of saying that's collective sense of who we are. I've watched our uh, Matildas, I've watched our Socceroos play in, against uh, international opponents. And what's been fantastic is watching the 
Australian uh, sporting lover, embrace them for uh, the what they represent, the collective Australia. Yes. And our Socceroos and our Matildas come from all different uh, backgrounds. We have Indigenous First Australians. We have uh, girls of Asian background. We have girls of European background. And it's that lovely mix that you touch on that we need to reinforce time and time again. But as I began this conversation, this uh, uh, webinar with uh, Chin Tan, the Racial Discrimination Commissioner, I did ask uh, for you to consider that there's an awful lot of uh, people out there taking advantage of this pandemic yes. to promote their particular narrative. And some of it has been ugly. Some of it has been divisive. And how do we address them? And I'm talking about some of the biggest players in, in, in Australia, some of the biggest media platforms that yes. see an opportunity to clickbait, as they say, to gather viewers, to drag listeners in. Uh, by creating this us and them. We saw it in the um, 90s when we, we saw two very uh, successful broadcasters. Uh, one was Alan Jones, the other was Ray Hadley. Both of them had a big hand in fomenting the troubles that, that turned out to be the Cronulla riots. They never had to stand up and explain their behaviour or their actions. Mm -hmm. Today, I think we need uh, everyone to say, that's not good enough, especially in 2020. Do you yeah. defer or, or, or you, you disagree? You've done, you've done my job for me with the last <laughs> statement. So uh, I'll hand to you my role. Or you can't get <laughs> more places. Uh, and that's, that's exactly the point. Uh, if you don't have an audience, it's very hard to be, you know, spooking all the negative, uh, you know, narratives out there. And this is important that intelligent Australians are able to understand the decency about it. It's a, hang on, that's not right. Right, let's reject that. Uh, firstly, narratives that are negative, that are inciting and inflaming, uh, ought to be called out and they'd be rejected. They'd be rejected from, you know, obviously the politicians, the prime minister, all the way down, and consistency of message. We as a nation, we don't take that. There's no room to move there. There's no advantage to be played out. Right? We reject it categorically. And this is an important message. This is what I'm saying we'd be out there. I'm out there all the time because people say, well, that's your job anyway, Chin, but it shouldn't be my job. Uh, we need media to come out and say, no, we need to, you know, Eddie Maguire's or this or anyone else, you know, AFL. You, you can't say, well, it's not to do with me. Well, it does. It's your community, right? And it involves you just as we do. And I like to see an AFL campaign, you know, that supports Asian Australians. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm very happy for the AFL to do a campaign, but I want it to be a meaningful campaign, not a totalist. Agreed, yeah. agreed, agreed, agreed. Yeah. agreed. Agreed, and, and that, that's a thing we talk about too, because sometimes we can cut, cut in the motion of putting up programs that may actually address some of these more, you know, I suppose overt issues, but not deal with the real contents of the work that we need to do to in fact counter racism. Uh, as in any webinar, we have questions that keep coming in, and it's one I should have addressed very, very early on to encourage people to uh, offer us questions. Uh, one of the questions has come through, and can you please talk about the responsibility of multicultural communities to educate their members, to increase their participation in, in society? For example, uh, conservative uh, uh, multicultural communities uh, holding women back. Now, uh, as a member of the board of women in football, I've got to say that I believe that we're, every board in Australia needs to address the, the goal one day of, of having boards that are 50-50, not 40, 30, 20, oh. 80, whatever, 50-50, because 50% 50 of, our, of our community are women. And we need to stand up and support them, help them. I have uh, my wife, who I'm very proud of. I have my daughter, who I'm very proud of. And I have a mother who has been a fierce combatant. You never mm. wanted to challenge her. And she's in her late 80s now. She's lost her husband. And I watch the people around her support her. And that's a very, very special feeling. Uh, and that gives me great hope. But what can we do? Because there are some communities that sure. are stuck in their ways and we need to bring them into sure. the 2020. Uh, George, precisely the reason why we need to engage more and not less. This okay. is what we're talking about. That that you know, in in one sense, and I, I don't always like to use the word mainstream, but but if you're talking about specific groups, then obviously 
the groups outside need to be able to understand, appreciate and accept and respect and work with them. I don't, I don't think um, there are enough communities in here in Australia who are happy to stay, oh, we want to be exactly where we came from. I don't think so. They chose Australia for a reason. All right? And they're more than happy sometimes because it's not easy to do that. And sometimes they're trapped in circumstances. And this is where Australia as a whole has a responsibility to deal with groups and work with them to bring them out and, and cherish the things that we share in common. But can I also say, multicultural groups, you know, by and large, are doing a great job. They, they, they abide by a lot of Australian values and adhere to it and love it. They're out there. There might be some groups as it would be and some groups have different views of you know, race and all of that. It's out there. But we need to work with groups you know, collectively, share with them to give them that sense of being open. But can I also say this, George, it's interesting that, that when people um, generally look at uh, multiculturalism, they look at the migrant facet. I say, well, hang on. My children are born here. They're not yeah. considered in that multicultural framework. They are the ones that people don't give attention to. They are fair dinky malls. They're out there. They're doing all sorts of things, but no one talks about it. And say, so, oh, look, it's the ones who just came off the boat, right? But the, yeah. you look at numbers, they're a minority. The Greeks, Italians, third, second generation, Chinese, fourth generations, right? Um, and the point you, is you, this, George, where, where is, is the fact that, that it, when it comes to racist activities, and people don't understand that the fourth generation Aussies still get targeted as if they just came <laughs> off the boat, right? And that's racism pure and simple. Oh, it is. I, I can remember in my early days as a young boy uh, turning up to Nielsen Park in Sydney, a beautiful parkland for all Australians. Uh, the taxi drivers knew it as Dago's Paradise. Then, of course, uh, in my days, in my early days at Bondi Beach, I was uh, uh, accosted as an ethnic and told to move off the beach, mate. This is for Aussies. I said, but I'm born here, mate. Precisely. So it's been a great yeah. journey. And I think it was amazing that Bruce Gingell, uh, who was my mentor and allowed me the opportunity to begin a career, a media career on SBS or television career on SBS. He said to me, uh, I want you for one reason, because you're the face of multiculturalism. I said, mate, up until about five minutes ago, I was an ethnic. He said, no, 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 no. You're the face of multiculturalism. And my that's a very good challenge. looking face as well, George. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but let's get back to one thing. Words are very, very important in news. Yes. They're very important in life. You're a, you're a lawyer uh, by training. Uh, you understand the role of advocacy. You also understand the weight of words and how important they are. Yeah. And for me, um, we keep hearing about um, how we have this inclusive um, approach uh, to so many things, curriculums, uh, um, staff, and so on. We, we talk about Australia being a really successful multicultural country, but are we really using the right word? We should be an extraordinarily inclusive country. Mm. It, that to me is important. Uh, words um, and the substance, obviously, are all yes. important. Yes. Uh, I, I always think of uh, the multicultural uh, concept and, and the way of life that we have as, as a multicultural big wonderful tree and oak tree and I always said how deep how deep are the roots because there'll be a storm there'll be storms that will come and would it stand the test and I always said everyone loves the big tree and it's shade under it and the politicians and everybody else and you know pluck the fruits and enjoy it they all love that but I said we need to invest in the roots to make sure that it will stand the test. When something happens and there might be some incidents that will happen and like we've seen COVID-19, it tests us, you know? And we're it talking has. about Kidori, wonderful, multicultural, how deep is this? Very important that we keep, and this is for me the work we do in trying to plant that seed and that, that roots and it goes deeper, it strengthens us all. When it comes to a crisis, we can withstand it and come up stronger. Well, COVID-19, this pandemic, has, as, as we touched on at the very beginning of this conversation, amplified a, a lot of the behaviour. Um, it's, it's also created enormous uh, pressures and addressed uh, or challenged our mental health as a community. Yes. Now, you talk about the, the roots of this tree being healthy. That means we have to go back to our schools, our front lines and our homes. Mm. That's where the messaging must start. I yes. was talking to a young woman the other day whose specialty is recycling. And she's the youngest member of the family. She's one of the smartest in the family. 
and she's been given the role of being a communications officer in her business. And she says to me that I've had to address the way I educate. I've had to address the way I, I preach. I have had to address the way I look at things in order to change behavior. And I said, what do you yes. mean? She says to me, we need to capture these young boys and girls and teach them at preschool about recycling, not grab them at 15, 16, 17, mm -hmm. when they're already set in their ways. Yes. Well, is that the case also? Is that the challenge for us with everything else that we're talking about today? Uh, George, no question about it. Uh, we, we talk about multiculturalism as if we have a few ingredients we can make the cake and it's all there. <laughs> uh, it, it will puff and it'd be beautiful, uh, it'd be tasty. It's not, it, it's far more than that. I, I've been to, in my time, even as a chair of the Multicultural Commission, been to many schools. And I, I'm, I'm delighted to see when teachers and principals walk to a class and said, Mr. Tan, we'll be fine. Look at the class of 40 from 34 different nationality primary school. They are growing up together like this, we'll be fine. And I said, that's a good start, but that's not all there is. Because finally, it's a commitment. If the kids don't understand what it means when they get to 18 or 19, when the world starts putting pressure on them, they see things differently. And those values of a friendship may not stand the test. And I'll give you an example of what I saw when I worked in Queensland. I traveled quite a fair bit. And a, um, a uh, service provider said to me, so, oh, this, this, this woeful experience, I went up to school and it was, you know, the multicultural and all. And I, I had kids, girls who grew up in that school together uh, from you know, very early um, in, in the primary years. And now they're, you know, in the secondary. And, and one who was obviously non-Muslim uh, saying to the next, oh, look, uh, you know, we can be friends in school, but not out there. Wow. See, and, and they grew up together. They grew up together. Peer, right? peer group pressure. Yes, because we have taught them about how to dissect those values and have different sets of meaning to it. But for me, multiculturalism is a commitment. It's commitment to the basics saying, I don't understand all you stand for, but I can respect that we live together in this. Because for me, we talk about cultural diversity. We talk about what is in common. AIS does a lot of that. But finally, George, multiculturalism, cultural diversity means just that when you remove all the layers of what we have in common, there's always gonna be one area where we have difference. That's the reason why it's called diversity. Correct. There's Correct. always something which will never get, and you can say to religion, I don't quite understand what you, why you do that, but mate, we're still friends and we will stand by you and we'll and do this. And we respect you. It's a, it's a um, commitment. It's a commitment as well, a price to pay. A price to pay. Uh, we have uh, a, a little time left. Uh, one question I want to address. How do you think Australia compares with the rest of the world in regards to dealing with this challenge that we've addressed today, uh, racism, um, particularly the nations that have uh, big multicultural communities in this country during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, Georgia, well, I won't confine it just to the COVID-19 because it's, it's too early to tell. Right. Uh, in different countries are now facing different China with the African communities and how they interact with Japan and you know, migrant communities, Singapore with its migrant workforce. Uh, over time, it, it may give us a better understanding. But, but collectively, well, I'm not praising Australia as, as the icon and the beacon. There's no beacon out there. Every country has got to raise problems to deal with in some sort, even, even Asian countries. I wasn't born here. I was, I was born up <laughs> in a country up in the north. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, you know, they have problems to deal with. Uh, and what we have, there's a saving grace for us is this. Our system is and was, it's intended to be anti-racist. Some countries don't have that framework. Uh, the laws are, in fact, racial in design. So if nothing else, we said, look, we can't control everyone's like, behavior and conduct, but we want a certain law that says you can't do this to people. Right. And, and so for me, the challenge is this, having set it in, let's, in statute, a statute and legislation, how do we behave accordingly, right, in our conduct personally, because we know it's wrong to be doing this. So the, the challenge for me is educate, educate, engagement, more Muslims and Chinese interacting, being a part of the community, being, uh, being Aussie, Aussie out there doing the usual things everyone else is doing, but still have the capacity to enjoy their own cultural background. That is the essence and that is the challenge to cultivate that oak tree and make it as strong. It's as very important can. for that to happen. Chin yeah. Tan, uh, as always, uh, a delight to have you with us, uh, especially when we talk uh, about a very important subject that you know and understand very well. 
Uh, your background, uh, I think, will uh, add a, a layer of, uh, of strength to this challenge that uh, we all have to address. I think uh, that you've given us an awful lot to think about. Uh, and may I get, provide you uh, with one last tip. Um, when the time comes and we lift all these restrictions, we want to see you uh, in Melbourne at a Melbourne City function and wearing the colours of Melbourne City and uh, standing there and taking on the opposition, whatever colour they are. All right? George, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's always a pleasure um, working with you and the AIS to, uh, because, not only because we, we, we share in common uh, the mission to do what we do, but I think the genuine understanding and respect uh, for what Australia needs you know, to, 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 to build itself into the future. Uh, I, I always say that I'm not, my job is not to chase after races. My, my is nation building, uh, to craft a nation where my kids' generation have less to deal with in the race issues. We'll build the bridges they can walk to and through. Uh, and this is an important element and they will have their own problems to deal with, but it's not our problem that we haven't dealt with and left for them to deal with. And, and so every generation would do that. And I'm here to do my bit, you know, to, to be able to find ways to smooth the path that this country, not just for migrant kids, but for all Australians, because that's a value we in fact believed in. But the thing that I also miss George, obviously coming from your thank you and appreciation is the fact that uh, at every AIS function I've attended, um, I miss receiving that wonderful plaque or a jar. <laughs> <laughs> Stand by, there may well be a jar. Uh, Australia Post has enormous responsibility. No, they're very good. Um, for those of you that haven't been to an AIS function, may I suggest you get to one soon uh, when they do lift the restrictions because they, they have a fantastic capacity, as Chin just alluded to, to present us with, uh, with a range of magnificent uh, porcelain and uh, pottery from uh, beautiful parts of the world. And they are unique, are they not, Chin? Yeah. Yeah. They are beautiful. I mean, I've got, I've got shelf full of it and i cherish that because everyone has a memory george and, and that's, that's what they are in. yes yeah, yeah. but can i can i just have a last word in this in just a Please. way of encouragement um you know one of the things that for me would be a delight is when we finished uh the COVID 19 um you know pandemic uh yeah experience and we came out of this and, and for me to report that i think we've done well as a country the resilience we have showed, the decency we showed to ourselves and the capacity of all ourselves to get, of course, the few incidents here and there, but by and large, we've acted as a very, very, you know, great nation and the people there and how we can improve from there. And for me, that is the biggest, the biggest challenge is to be said, like, we've done that as a nation. And if not, how can we improve on it? But, but for, for now, obviously, understanding the frustration that people might have with isolation and all that is, is to, Take a pause, you know, sit back and reflect, you know, um, think through the issues and then see how you can, in fact, act more positively, contributing, supporting each other. So take a stand for the community, take a stand for, you know, for this country and then take a stand, obviously, against racism. I like the fact that uh, you've touched on what we started with. We're all in this together. Yes. And uh, together we can make an enormous uh, difference. So, uh, Chin Tan, thank you very much once thank again. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. For Take care us on this and keep special, safe. Special webinar for the Australian Intercultural Society. Well, thank you, AIS, and uh, Amit Keskin as well uh, for the wonderful work you do. Thank you. And, 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 and happy Ramadan. Thank you.